My name is Pat Kaplan and I'm a carer for my husband who has multiple physical and mental health problems. And I would like to introduce you to Phil Thomas. Thank you very much, Pat. Okay. From your perspective, what do you see as causing or contributing to mental distress? I think I'm going to have to answer that question in a rather roundabout way by first of all just describing to you how psychiatry, how the medical model in psychiatry um, interprets and understands distress. Um, psychiatry um, makes the assumption that the various forms of distress that people experience, whether it's depression, hearing voices or having strange or unusual beliefs, arise because of disturbances in brain function. Now there's a long history in psychiatry for this, it goes back at least 150 years, probably to the middle of the 19th century. Um, and at the end of the 19th century the, the, the ideas were sown in German psychiatry that resulted in the major categories of mental illness that we have today and that we, that we recognize conditions like schizophrenia, for example, or severe forms of depression, affective disorder. It, in the large asylums at the end of the 19th century, there were many, many different types of people brought together under those roofs. Some of them had conditions like neurosyphilis, um, um, pellagra, vitamin deficiencies, epilepsy, a wide range of very serious physical problems, together with people who today would be recognized as suffering from conditions like schizophrenia. Now, of course, as the, the health of the population as a whole has improved over the last 100 years, those um, sort of physical forms of insanity or madness are now much less common. We hardly ever see them at all, largely because of advances in medicine. But what's happened is that we are still left with these conditions, schizophrenia, manic depression, those sorts of uh, disorders um, as they're seen. And what happened in the asylums of the early 19th, uh, late 19th century was that the early psychiatrists believed that conditions like schizophrenia would turn out to have physical causes like neurosyphilis, um, vitamin deficiencies, epilepsy. And throughout the 20th century, what we've seen is a, um, a repeated history of investigations into uh, attempts to find the underlying physical basis of conditions. Let's take schizophrenia as an example because it's probably the best known one. And so that um, I remember when I first started training in psychiatry in the mid-1970s that um, the dopamine theory of schizophrenia had just come into uh, popularity. I think the work that was the seminal papers on that were published in the early 1970s. And um, that replaced a whole series of earlier theories about schizophrenia which were no longer thought to be true or important, that people were interested in pink spots in people's urine and things like that. Now, over the years, and especially as new forms of technology have grown, um, psychiatrists and researchers have subjected the brain to examination in any number of different ways in an attempt to find this elusive abnormality in the brain of people who suffer from schizophrenia. Uh, but again, the history over the last 30 or 40 years has been that yes, we found that we found out that um, let's say there are these abnormalities in these receptors. But actually, when you take into account the fact that people have been treated with neuroleptic medication, you find that those abnormalities were related to the treatment, or they were related to institutionalization, or they were related to other aspects of the care that people receive for schizophrenia. So, what I'm going on to say is that. Where we are at the moment, at the beginning of the 21st century, sort of 150 years on into this exploration of the, the, the causes of conditions like schizophrenia, is, to be frank, we're not any further on than we were 150 years ago. And, and, I mean, people will say, well, 
Phil Thomas will say that anyway because he's critical of he's a critical psychiatrist. Um, I would simply refer you to um, things that prominent American psychiatrists, most notably Professor Nancy Andreessen in the University of Iowa, who is a, a leading authority on neuroscientific research. And in a number of interviews and articles that she's published lately, towards the end of her career, she's admitted that really we're no further on in terms of understanding the the causes of madness, that if you like the 1990s were called the decade of the brain in America. George Bush Sr. announced in 1991 that uh, there was going to be a huge investment of um, resource, of research and money into trying to find the causes of schizophrenia. And Nancy Andreessen was very much um, a part of that um, process in American psychiatry. She wrote and published a book in the mid-1990s called The Broken Brain. But sort of 15 years on from that now, um, people like Nancy Andreessen and, and other prominent American psychiatrists who've been right at the, at the heart of this um, uh, sort of um, search for the biological basis of psychosis are actually turning around now and saying, well, to be honest, we're not really any further on. So that leaves the question, how are we to understand these conditions? That's not. Uh, this is where I would say that my position is really very different from, let's say, the anti-psychiatrists in the 1960s. Um, Thomas Zaz, for example, famously declared that the idea of mental illness was a myth, that there was no such thing as m m mental illness. And that's plainly, to me, absurd, because... People suffer, families suffer, um, individuals suffer um, enormously from the experiences associated with, with madness and psychosis. Um, so I think really we have to turn to other ways of trying to understand what um, the experience of psychosis is, what might bring it about, what causes it, and, and how we might understand and respond to it. <clears throat> and I suppose that there are some useful ways of beginning to think about that now, that are beginning to change the way we think about it, that um, epidemiologists, for example, epidemiologists are scientists who study the patterns of diseases in large numbers of people in populations and, and across countries and across cultures. There's been a lot of epidemiological research over the last 15 to 20 years that shows quite interestingly that if you actually um, go out into the community and ask lots and lots of people on the street, let's say, whether or not they've ever had an experience like hearing voices or whether or not they've ever had strange or unusual beliefs, that around between 10 to 15 percent of people will actually say, yes, I've had the experience of hearing voices. Now that's far higher than the number of people who would ever actually present to psychiatrists and, and have a diagnosis of schizophrenia. And furthermore, when you actually study these people, as, as has been done both in, in London, in America, and um, in, in one or two other places recently, um, when you actually subject them to interviews and you, you actually examine in detail the nature of their experiences and the effects that these experiences have on people's lives, they're every bit as, um, they're, they're, they're almost, they are identical to the sorts of experiences that people would have if they were seeing a psychiatrist and had a diagnosis of schizophrenia. So I think, the pr so the point about this is that I think we're moving away from the idea now where we think of psychosis as being something that's related solely to a small number of people who have a diagnosis of schizophrenia. And we see the propensity or the extent to which an individual is likely to have an experience like hearing voices or strange beliefs as distributed throughout the whole population. In other words, um, experiences like voices or strange or unusual beliefs exist on a continuum, that there's no difference between people in the community who have these experiences and people who get to see psychiatrists. The only, and this is really important, the only major difference between people in the community who hear voices, let's say, and those who are psychiatric patients, is that psychiatric patients um, find it much more difficult to cope with their experiences and are either much more distressed by their experiences or 
they alternatively they cause people concern because they have them. 